individuality, the trademark of any artist, designer, or architect. Each desires a uniqueness to their creation, a quality that separates it from any other. Man naturally has this individuality, his fingerprint. There are 6.5 billion people on the face of the earth, and no two fingerprints are the same. Everything we touch or make contact with is branded with a small expressed image revealing to all who see it who was there. Around 1200 AD, a man named Leonard Pisano, better known as Fibonacci, discovered a sequence of numbers that created a very interesting pattern. The sequence begins with the numbers 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, and continues indefinitely. Each number is obtained by adding the last two digits together. A rectangle with a length and width of any two of the numbers of this sequence forms what is known as the golden rectangle, a perfect rectangle. A golden rectangle can be broken down into squares the size of the next Fibonacci numbers down and below. If we were to take a perfect or golden rectangle, break it down into smaller squares based on Fibonacci's sequence, and divide each with an arc, the patterns begin to take shape. We begin to see Fibonacci's spiral. The spiral in and of itself is insignificant. Its importance is revealed in where we find it. Take for example the sunflower. The display of its florets are in perfect spirals of 55, 34, and 21, the sequence of Fibonacci. The fruitlets of the pineapple create the same spiral based on the sequence. The pine cone does the same. As currents move through the ocean and the tide rolls onto the shore, the waves that bring in the tide curve into a spiral that can be mathematically diagrammed onto a plot at the points 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, and 55. Buds on trees, sand dollars, starfish, petals on flowers, and especially the nautilus shell are formed with this exact same blueprint. With each segment of growth, the nautilus adds to itself one more value on Fibonacci's scale. This blueprint can be seen around us on a small scale every day, but the greatest example of all is directly above our heads. At an average of 100,000 light years across, even the spiral of the galaxies above us are formed with the exact design that the tiny shell is formed. This sequence or blueprint appears to be the trademark of a designer, a proof of a creator, something left behind indicating the one who was there, a fingerprint. As we scan our universe from the tiny flower to the awe-inspiring galaxy, we see the fingerprint of God. As you know, Mother Nature uses all kinds of mathematical languages. That when we go to understand physical phenomena, we generally find that there's some sort of mathematical underpinning to whatever the phenomena is. You know, like the Fibonacci sequence? That's like that series you find in nature? Like the face of a sunflower? Where are the spirals? You see this math everywhere. How did we end up in a universe like that? Why should the world behave according to mathematical laws? And it turns out, in fact, all of our senses appear to rely on sort of Fourier transforms, that they all seem to use the same mathematics. So again, here's evidence that the brain uses the same mathematics to decipher the sensory world as are involved in the making of a hologram, mm -hmm. which is, as I say, not proof, but compelling evidence that something is going on there. Not only that it becomes easier to describe with mathematics, as you go deeper and deeper into reality, mathematics becomes the only way to describe reality. There's a conspiracy to hide this information that DNA is a Fibonacci, is an exemplification of this number called, or entity uh, ratio sequence called the uh, Golden Ratio. The ratio that proves the existence of intelligent design, or the uh, reality of intelligent design of the cosmos. I mean, if you go to the Golden Ratio site for Wikipedia 2 on the same theme, um, 
they don't mention any of this stuff in nature that we're going to talk about here that we talked about on the show two days ago and that we're talking about here. They talk about how it's found in architecture and math and all this kind of stuff. They don't discuss it, how it's found in the measurements of the human arm. Why not? It's just, it's, it, I mean, well, I think I'm making, that's the point here. I think that just made sense to me, thinking this through as I say it to you. It has to be a conspiracy. How could all of this be overlooked and how could Wikipedia leave it out? It's, it can't be, it has to be somehow that big money has pushed their influence uh, somehow and they've had a drive to keep this covered up or something. These can't all be coincidences. And since they're doing that with everything else, it has to be the case that uh, there's some movement to keep this stifled. I mean, why isn't, and here's another piece to add to this. Why isn't this in our education system? We learn all this junk geometry, pea brain stuff when you take geometry in high school, and they don't teach you about any of this? The golden ratio everywhere in nature? I, I went through elementary school, you know, high school, college, uh, you know, undergrad degree in college, uh, master's degree, and halfway through PhD, and never was this, any of this mentioned. It, and we know who controls the universities, uh, the big money behind it, all the way up to the Illuminati Nephilim uh, controllers. So this can't be. This is planned, okay? And you just wonder. It's got. I mean, I'm almost concluding here in my mind. This Davidson college site showing up number one in Google all the time and first page and Wikipedia having the strange measurements which don't correlate with all kinds of these examples from academic sites I'm finding and I'm putting them all pictures of the uh, screenshots in the newsletter um, it's got to be a conspiracy I mean we could keep going compiling the evidence it would just all lead to it so and that and if we could keep compiling evidence of it being a conspiracy I mean, everything points towards it. I'm just throwing ideas off the top of my head. These strange sites show up at the top. Wikipedia is wrong. It's covered up completely in, in the best-selling books about the Golden Ratio, which come from uh, wealthy university professors. It's uh, the universities and the education, government-controlled education system absolutely covers it up. You see how I mean everything's falling in the same direction. You know, the, so when everything, uh, all these conclusions point to the same direction that it's covered up and hidden. The geometry, the structure of nature, is designed on the basis of what is called fractal geometry. And fractal geometry is unique geometry, not the one we learn in school. The geometry we did learn in school called Euclidean geometry, you can't model nature with it. it does, all those triangles, cones, cubes, and spheres are not what nature really looks like. But in, when we were five years old, in kindergarten, we made a tree. We made a Euclidean tree. We had like a, a cylinder for the trunk and a ball for the top. But obviously that's not nature-like. That geometry is not the nature geometry. We now recognize this new geometry that really came into our world in 1983 with the work of Benoit Mendelbrot from IBM called fractal geometry and it's a different version of geometry and it's very exciting but here's the fundamental key characteristic of this geometry built into the nature of the mathematics is a reality that images of the structure repeat themselves in a very self-similar fashion at any level of the organization that you're talking about so if you want to talk about cells or people or civilizations they're all built on the same geometry but the key word for most people to understand is that this geometry links an ancient mystical understanding. Uh, there was a phrase that uh, people are familiar with, as above, so below. Well, in this new geometry, that becomes mathematical and scientific as a reality. Every atom is a mini black hole, that it has infinite density, that it has infinite potential, that everything has singularity at its center. Um, the vacuum energy, the structure of the vacuum itself uh, interlinked or entangles all protons, the, the proton being the nuclei of an atom, the, that all the nuclei of atoms are entangled because of the structure of the vacuum, that the structure, that, that the vacuum is not a passive vacuum but an active vacuum that has a role to play in the creation of the, our, our material world but as well is the structure that connects all things. So actually this is a mathematical rendering of the concept everything is one so that it actually is 
are mathematically proven. That's why I can study the nature of a cell and understand the nature of a human because a human is a fractal image of a cell. We were made out of cells, we're just a, a large version of a cell. And so that a human body turns out not to be a one thing as we see it in the mirror, but when we really understand, if you could see it with microscopic eyes so you could see what it looked like, you recognize that a human body is a community of upwards to 50 trillion cells. Every cell is essentially a miniature human. Because virtually every cell has every function that I have in my body, it's already present. As a matter of fact, any function that I do with my body is only because a cell can do that function because I'm made out of cells. Oh, I think that um, the world of physics and the world in general is transforming and that there's an opening that's occurring and certainly in physics, um, you know, there's a level of arrogance that's slowly uh, fading away, you know, not so long ago when I started in uh, bringing my work to the physics community some 15 to 20 years ago, the tendency was to think we've got the universe pretty well all figured and all we need is a few little things to work out and then we've ha we have it. And so there was a lot of, um, you know, arrogance in the way, you know, physicists were interacting with new ideas and so on. And so it was extremely difficult to be heard. But uh, since then, a lot of failures in our theories have come forward. A lot of experiments in the laboratory and, you know, data from cosmological instruments and so on have shown us that there's anomalies that we cannot explain with the standard model and all sorts of things are coming up. And so, uh, you know, a certain level of failure of string theory and so on. And I think that uh, it's, uh, it's changed the world of physics. The same responses of cells to their world are exactly uh, the same kind of behavioral responses that we have in our own world, in the world the way we live. So that it becomes understandable. This, this is why, for example, why we work on cells in biology. Because if we get an understanding of the nature of the cells, we can apply that information directly to the nature of human biology so that we extend this work. So in looking at nature as fractal and recognizing that the cell is the fundamental unit of the human body, that the human body is actually built in the image of that cell, then we start to recognize, look, inside of you right now are 50 trillion citizens. Their, each cell is its own sentient being. When I was culturing these cells, I'd take them out of a person's body, put them in a culture dish, they have their own life. They didn't need us. It helps to get uh, other physicists to look at it, to get some uh, credibility in the physics I'm writing, and to make people aware that we are not living in a finite world, that you know the atomic structure itself has this infinite potential within it that, you know, when people are talking philosophically or spiritually about their infinite nature and all this stuff, it doesn't have to be outside the physical world, that the actual physical world is what they're talking about, that, you know, philosophy and spirituality are not divorced from the atomic structure, that the atomic structure is actually a manifestation of uh, this dynamic of creation that, you know, we might call uh, consciousness or spirituality and so on.